quizzers. Well, welcome back to our study of the book of James. I know you've been looking forward to this all week, so uh, hopefully you're uh, coping with this uh, long period of separation here, and hopefully you're not getting too tired of being a stick stuck with your family all this time. And hopefully you're getting a chance to communicate with some of your friends by some sort of social media, even if you can't be with them in person. We do all look forward to getting together again uh, soon. So before we get started today, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you so much for the gift of your word, that we can have it and read it and study it. We know that your word is living and active. So we ask now as we study your word and discuss your word that your word would pierce our hearts and come into our lives, change us, transform us, uh, help us to see where we need to make changes in our lives and give us the strength and the courage and the ability to, to make those changes. I thank you for these quizzers. I ask that you would bless them during this time of separation, help them to not get discouraged, give them the hope that only you can provide. We ask that you would be with us now as we study this book of James. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Hey, just two more chapters. Uh, this one and then uh, chap chapter five, and then uh, we're done. Uh, chapter four is the shortest uh, of the book of James, shortest chapter. It's only 17 verses. But just because it's the shortest chapter doesn't mean my talk is going to be the shortest. So uh, James is going to continue to talk about not being just listeners of the word, but actually being doers of it. If you remember at the end of chapter 3, uh, James was discussing worldly wisdom, uh, that philosophy of life that's characteristic of the mind apart from Christ, and sometimes uh, believers in Christ also tend to drift over into that worldly wisdom also. He specified uh, bitter envy and selfish ambition. Uh, now he's going to look at that worldly wisdom, that worldly attitude in a little bit more detail. Uh, he's going to look at some of the source of some worldly friction. Uh, and he's going to talk about spiritual unfaithfulness and then the, the idea of submitting to God. He's going to include that. So he starts off, James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? <laughs> you know, we can be so arrogant and independent towards God. We think that we can do everything uh, if there's one single obstacle, probably, that uh, in our lives of growing as a disciple of Jesus, it's our pride, our self. We are the enemy. Uh, our pride is not the type of good self-esteem that we need to grow as people, but it's that variety of I can do it by myself and I don't need any help type of pride and I'm good enough uh, that we can just fall into uh, very easily. It all starts in the heart, and our focus on ourselves it causes all kinds of problems. So we as Christians should live together in peace and harmony but instead of that uh, environment of peace that's necessary for a harvest of righteousness that James talks about. James' readers were evidently living in an atmosphere of constant fights and quarrels. There was some strife there. Probably as a pastor uh, in Jerusalem, James had seen his share of bickering and picking and criticizing, uh, and that finds its root in pride also. And James is going to address it in this chapter. He starts again with a question. What causes fights and quarrels among you? That's a good question to try to ask. He answers his own question with a rhetorical question to which he expects his readers to all agree. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So he uses a bunch of military terms here, the terms fights, quarrels, battle. Those are all military types of terms. He realizes that we are in a war amongst ourselves and within ourselves. We're in a war. Uh, the Greek word for desires is the source of our English word hedonism. Hedonism is that uh, philosophy that views pleasure as the chief goal of life. Eat, drink, and be merry. So James pictures these pleasures as residing when, within us, within his readers that are reading his letter. That's the uh, overall desire of our lives is to make ourselves happy. And nothing's going to stand in the way of it. Uh, so we fight and we quarrel. He continues in verse 2, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. That you desire uh, is this anxious longing, an eager desire for something. You really want something. It's so strong that you kill and covet, he says. Now, it's difficult to believe that James's readers are actually uh, killing, being guilty of murder. He does describe them as Christians in chapter 2. But uh, 
Although murder and killing is the net result of, uh, if you take it to its final conclusion, of wanting what you want, if you want something other than God. But I think it's best to think of uh, you kill as more of a hyperbole for hatred, sort of like uh, Jesus says that in Matthew that uh, hatred is equivalent to murder. You've murdered in your heart. Or it's the internal result of anger. Remember, James has already told us that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So even if not literally killing, our anger and animosity kill others in our heart. We, have, we are guilty of not loving our neighbors as ourselves. And he says we covet. Covet is the strong desire for something that doesn't belong to us. That's what coveting is. Usually it belongs to someone else. So we'll see someone else with something and we covet it. We want that for ourselves. Okay, And so uh, it, that's a sin. It's uh, listed as a sin in the Ten Commandments uh, because it's, it, it's indicative of a heart that's not content with what the Lord has already given us. So James says we fight and we quarrel. We hate or we kill and we covet. We want something for ourselves. That's the opposite of loving our neighbors. James on, goes on to assert the, that his readers were not able to obtain what they wanted because they were going after it in the wrong way. They did not ask God for it. So he says, one of the reasons we don't have what we want is because we don't ask God for it. Well, why don't we ask God? Well, there's probably lots of reasons why we don't ask God. Sometimes we're afraid to bring God into our lives too much because uh, we may not like what he has to say. We may think that uh, he doesn't want us to have it, and that may well be that we're not supposed to have it. And we know that we're not supposed to have it, so we don't want to ask God for it. Uh, sometimes we uh, know that it's outside of God's will, so we're not going to ask for it. Sometimes our view of God is that he's just a big spoil sport. He doesn't want us to have any fun, so he's not going to give us what we want. So we have a wrong perception of God as that party pooper type of guy. Uh, or perhaps our pride is in the way we think we can do it ourselves, so we don't ask God. So there's many different reasons why we may not ask God. But James says you don't ask, and so that's why you're not getting it. Okay? You don't ask, you don't get Instead, we would rather fight and quarrel about it rather than uh, pray about it. Uh, which is pretty sad for Christians. But there's another reason that James says for not getting what we want. Even if we do pray for it, uh, in verse 3, when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So even when we do ask God for things, uh, we don't receive what's requested. Uh, why? Because James says we're asking with wrong motives. Our desire is to get something for ourselves so that what he calls we can spend it on ourselves for our own pleasures. That word pleasures there is the same word as desires he has back up in verse 1. Uh, just remember that in verse 1 they translate it as desires and in verse 3 it's pleasures. So this would be kind of like the story of the prodigal son who asks for his inheritance early and then goes out and just spends it all on wasteful living. Uh, that's the sort of picture James has here that you're getting you, you want so you can get it and then just spend it on your own pleasure. It's a desire for this pleasure, this hedonism, this being happy at all costs. That's battling inside of us for our satisfaction. That's what's trying to make us happy. That's what James says. And it can even uh, we can even use prayer to try to get that, thinking that we'll get what, we're, what we want, what we desire. So we pray, but God isn't in the business of just giving us everything that we want. Okay, if he knows our real motives for asking for something, and so it may not be good for us to get what we want. Uh, we think that everybody's supposed to, everybody wants to be happy, but uh, personal happiness is what uh, not what God is looking for in our own circumstances. He's looking for something more permanent. He's looking for joy. Okay, so uh, our personal happiness may be our goal in life, but it's not his. He wants us to be godly people. Okay. Uh, so, seeking personal happiness uh, could mean the why we want that is because we haven't surrendered our lives completely to God, uh, to what God wants to accomplish in us, or uh, it means also that we're not living our, our lives for others, we're living our lives for ourselves. So, both of those road motives are wrong, uh, whatever it is, whether we haven't turned our lives over or we just are trying to get things for ourselves at the expense of others with no sacrifice on our part, that's, that's wrong. So, pursuit of personal happiness is uh, selfish. Uh, it's that's so it's sinful, uh, but it is very common philosophy in the world. It's the world system, and we take it for granted, and so we tend to we can easily kind of drift over into that direction, uh, into just wanting our own personal happiness. And James is calling us out for those motives. Those wrong motives can can and does block 
our, our prayers. It would be like uh, asking your dad for some money and then going out and using it to carouse or waste it on some momentary pleasure. Uh, how long do you think he's going to keep on giving you that money if he knows that that's uh, what you're doing with it, if you're wasting it on those sort of things? Uh, God can, uh, you can sort of think of it that way. So having identified this source of bitter fighting as being from the desire for pleasure for ourselves, he then rebukes his readers for this straying away from God. Verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enemy, enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So enmity and enemy. So James now, literally, he's addressing these, this group of readers as you adulterous. So he, he uses a, a feminine name there, but the NIV translates it so it goes across all sexes here. Uh, adulterous people is what the NIV translates it as. You would think that maybe James would use uh, adulterer, the male uh, counterpart for it, since probably most of his readers are, are male. But he uses the feminine form because he's referring to believers to, as, as the body of Christ, that it's be like you're married to God. It's, uh, that's a theme that goes back into the Old Testament. You can read the book of Hosea, the theme of, of Israel being the wife of God or God as being her husband. And it includes, it goes into the New Testament also. We are depicted the, as the bride of Christ. So James is writing to this Jewish heritage people when he calls them an adulteress, their mind immediately would go like to Hosea to say, I understand what he's calling. He's calling us just like uh, Hosea was talking about with Israel, that we have, an, we're tended towards an adulterous affair. We're going after another person besides God. So they would see that. So when he says, you adulterous people, uh, that would definitely wake them up. Uh, they would see that and that would jar them. And they, they start maybe with really taking it to heart. So it's taken from the Old Testament, and they would understand that. So basically, James is saying there's, there's two objects, two possible objects for our affections. We can either have our, the world's view of, of what we want to have. Our, that includes ourselves. So we go after what the world thinks is pleasure, or we can go after God as who we are going to seek our, our pleasure from, our desire. Who's that's going to be our desire, the world or God? Two choices. You can't have both. It's either or. Uh, the world, uh, James uses the, the word cosmos. So we get that. We see that. That means everything that sort of tends to take us away from God, the world's system. It doesn't necessarily mean just a planet. It means the world's system, everything that tends to lure people away from God. Okay? So James says that uh, by that nature, friendship with the world is hatred toward God. So to have this warm, familiar, inviting attitude towards the world system, which is opposed to God's system, that then is to be on good terms with God's enemies. And so therefore, it is to adopt that set of views. If you're going over with the enemy, then the person who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes now an enemy of God. Okay, so that's, that's sort of his logic. James further explains in, in verse 5, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. Now, to be honest, this verse is probably the most difficult verse uh, in the entire book of James. Okay, the, the Greek is kind of ambiguous, and so therefore it's hard to know exactly how to translate it. Uh, so there are a couple of different problems. Various translations translate different ways. They've been suggested. If you look in your uh, quiz portion down at the bottom, you'll see a couple other possible translations of this verse. Okay, uh, so the first debate is in it. The question is who is, who is the one doing the longing? It says he jealously he jealously longs. So the question is who is it that's doing the longing? Two possibilities. Okay, uh, is it uh, God that's doing the longing, or is it the Spirit that's doing the longing? Okay, in this translation we have here, it's God who jealously longs for the Spirit. The other two possibilities down at the bottom of your quiz portion. Uh, say it could be the spirit is the one doing the longing. The second debate besides who's doing the longing is that which spirit is being referred to here? Is it the spirit of man, that spirit that God at creation, he puts into every person, every person who's born has a spirit, okay? Body, mind, spirit. He has a, this spirit, this uh, part of our body that's not physical. He has that spirit in him. So is that what he's talking about, the spirit of God or the spirit that God has put into each man, 
whether they're believer or non-believer, is that the spirit he's talking about? Um, even though it may be a fallen spirit, it's still a spirit with inside of us, that part that's not the physical part of us. Or is he talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, that spirit that God causes to dwell within believers? Um, so if you notice that in your two options down at the bottom of your uh, study guide at your, in your quiz portion, you'll see that one of them has a small s, so it could be the human spirit, and one of them has a capital S, so it could be talking about the human spirit, or the, the Holy Spirit. So, based on those different, how you translate it, it could be that God longs for our human spirit, which he places in everyone, believers and non-believers, or our human spirit longs for God, or it could be that God longs for the Holy Spirit, which he causes to dwell in every believer, or it could be that the Holy Spirit in us longs for God. Okay, all of those are true in some fashion. Okay, so they could all be valid translations. The question is, which of those did James mean for his readers? Uh, so the way our translators work, translation is worded here in this verse, he uses a smaller case, S, so that makes it sound like it's the human spirit. Uh, and our verse has God as the one doing the longing. So the verse is saying that God, whom Scripture says is a jealous God, okay, remember we're not supposed to have any other gods before him. He is a jealous God, kind of like a jealous husband. He will not tolerate us having another husband beside himself. So this jealous God, it says that he jealously longs for the spirit that each of us have within us, that spirit that he gave us, or as the verse says, cause to dwell in us. So this holy God jealously longs for our spirit. Okay, He wants us. God wants our heart, our desire, our affection, our devotion. He wants all that to be for him and for him only. Verse 4 already indicates that believers who are friends with the world are guilty of spiritual adultery. Okay, so they're guilty. We're, those people are guilty of spiritual adultery, although their love and devotion should belong to God as, as, as their husband. They have fallen in love with the world. And so, therefore, it's natural to expect in verse 5, uh, and it's tied to verse 4 because it says in there, or uh, do you not think so? It's tied back to verse 4. To it's natural then to speak of God's jealousy, jealously longing for his people's love. In verse 4, he accused the readers of spiritual unfaithfulness. And if they're not willing to accept that about their own indictment, he then says, well, then what do you think the scripture means when he says he's jealously longing for us? If it's not because you are being unfaithful to him, that's why he's being jealously longing for you. Uh, so he's trying to get the point. That's why, do you think that, that scripture speaks without reason about that? And then, of course, their answer would be, oh, no, I don't think scripture is saying that without reason. Uh, and so James is saying, well, then you, you're, the reason why he says that is because you're not being spiritually uh, faithful. So therefore, he jealously longs for the spirit that he caused to dwell within each one of us. Okay, so, so therefore, believing that friendship with the world is en enmity towards God, and that is spiritual unfaithfulness, like an adulteress. Uh, all right, so in, in quizzing, you may come across this, uh, a couple different things here. You may hear a question on this verse. You could hear the question asked, for what does God jealously long? And the answer would be, the spirit he caused to dwell in us. Or you may hear it phrased as, for whom does God jealously long? And that would be the same answer, okay, the, the spirit he caused to, to dwell in us. It's just that in the second question, the way it is, for whom does God jealously long, that verse is being interpreted as the Holy Spirit that's in us, because the spirit is a who and not a what. Whereas the other question, if it's asked, for what does God jealously long, that's being interpreted as the Holy human spirit, which is, I think, the way that the NIV is translating it here. So you could hear the question either way, uh, and the answer is the same. So just don't be thrown by the question. If, it's a, if you hear that word jealously, because that's a unique word, it must be coming from this. So if you hear that jealously long, whether it says for whom or for what, the answer is going to be uh, the spirit that he caused to dwell in us. Okay, moving on. Verse 6, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So the meaning in this whole section of verses here is that God's a jealous God who wants us for his own people. And he has set a high standard for this wholehearted love and devotion that we're supposed to give him. We're supposed, he is supposed to be our husband. We're supposed to love him and him only. That's a very high standard. Uh, and he knows that we can't, okay? He knows that we're going to be tempted to sort of go astray and seek after the world uh, and giving into that temptation that makes us adulterous. So he has a high standard, but God knows that, and he gives grace 
that is even greater than that high standard. So James says, but he gives us more grace. It's kind of like the song that says, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. So God gives us more grace. He says, but in there, but God, he gives us more grace, okay, even than this standard for uh, being faithful to him. This assurance uh, is documented in Proverbs. That's what he's quoting here. Uh, and so in the second part in there, he, he quotes it there. In the second part, he says, Scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. That favor is in place of grace. It's the same, same basic word. Uh, so he gives us more grace. So he shows favor to the humble. Uh, the fact that we don't measure up to the standard uh, as being the bride of Christ, that should keep us humble instead of proud. If we're proud and don't think that we've sinned, God opposes us. God opposes the proud. But if we're humble, if we look into that mirror of Scripture and see the flaws that are in us that need correcting, recognize that we have not loved God with our whole heart, we repent, well, then he has mercy and grace, or as he says here, he shows favor to the humble, to us. This process is going to last the rest of our lives, okay? We are, need to stay humble because we're always going to be learning. We're always going to be needing grace. We're always going to uh, fall astray, go astray of this. We're always going to be the adulterous wife. So this uh, reference to humble is the sort of the theme for the opening verses uh, and for the next coming verses here also, where he's pleading uh, for us to be submissive as humble people, being submiss submissive to God. We should be willing to submit to God's desire for us rather than proudly insisting on our own way, our own desires for pleasure and follow the ways of this world. Verse 7, submit yourselves then, so that then there's kind of like so it's therefore, uh, so, but it's then in this case. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, meaning the devil will flee from you. So this next section is going to be a whole list of commands. It's just going to be command, 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 command uh, that he has here. Uh, the first one he has here is to, to submit yourselves. Each one of these commands is going to be in the form of the Greek that it calls for an immediate response. It is, do this now. It's not just think about doing it or do it in the future. It's like, you need to do this now. Um, and so the first one is a command to submit. Okay, that should be the logical response to us being humble. Okay, it was that we should submit. Instead of being proud, he opposes the proud. He gives favor to the humble. Therefore, you should submit yourselves to God. That's why he says then. Submit yourselves then or therefore. Okay, since God opposes the proud, shows favor to the humble, we should submit to him. We discussed submission when we were back in the book of Romans. Okay, uh, again, when we were talking about that, it means to stand under. Okay, so you put someone above yourself. You're placing your will below their will. Okay, you're submitting your will to the person to whom you're standing under or to whom you're submitting. Our will must have been to God's will. It's not necessarily the same thing as obedience. Instead, it's the surrender of your will. So if your will surrenders to that person's will above you, then in turn, you're just going to want to do what he wants you to do. So it leads to obedience, but it's just not quite the same. Okay, so rather than resisting God, which is what would happen uh, if we were proud, instead of resisting God, we should resist the devil. Okay, this word resist means to set against, to oppose, to withstand. A lot of times our problem is that we're double-minded and we cling both to ourself, our selfish desires, and a desire to please God. So James uh, appears to suggest that our spiritual unfaithfulness, why we tend to go away from God, go to a different husband, the world, or our own selfish desires, he basically says that that's sort of the result of the devil's influence. The devil plays on our own desire. We saw that in James 1, 14 and 15, where it drags us away, leads to sin to death. Tries to convince us that these shortcuts of, for our own desires uh, will get us there better than the way that God has planned. So the devil is the ruler of this world, so the world tempts us to stray from God. And James says, therefore, this temptation is from Satan, and we must resist that temptation. So he says, resist the devil. It means stop flirting with temptation to say no to him and yes to God. The promise that he will flee from you uh, gives us assurance of that promise that as powerful as Satan is, Satan can be resisted. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, meaning Satan. James continues, come near to God. So rather than resist him, resist the devil, run away from him, but come near to God and he will come near to you. So if, if you want God to come near to you, if you want God to... If you want to experience the presence of God, you go, go near to him and he will come 
near to you. He says, uh, come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, uh, in setting their hearts on pleasure, James's readers and, and us, uh, by implication, by reading it, we've drifted away from God. So although we're still his people, uh, we've sort of become estranged from him. So it's like still being married but separated or just not having the relationship that you should be having with your spouse. Uh, and so James says to come back, come back to God. Uh, remember that uh, God jealously longs for our hearts, for our devotion. Uh, so James says, come back and God will welcome you back. Uh, come near to God and he will come near to you. Uh, the next part of this verse is our quote for the month. Wash your hands. How many times have you heard that this month, huh? Uh, it's scriptural. It's in the Bible. Wash your hands, uh, you sinner. Uh, you sinners. The, the wash your hands is the idea of, of making your deeds pure. Uh, making your conduct pure. Stop doing wrong is basically what he's saying. Uh, that desire for pleasure that uh, James talks about that we're trying to do uh, is resulted in sins. Uh, and so the sins is that it, because it's action sins, it's uh, in our hands is what he talks about. So we need to wash our hands. And he calls them you sinners. That's a pretty blunt, strong term. Uh, that shows what they've become. Okay, uh, So it's a pretty... Pretty blunt action, uh, words to use there, to, again, to try to wake them up. Uh, similarly, the call, just like wash your hands, he then uses the other part to purify your hearts. So your hands are the outside part. It's what's doing the sinning. But the problem really is in your heart. So he says, purify your hearts. And that's something that God does, but uh, you need to help also can do that, uh, is to help get rid of that impurity in your heart, our thoughts, our motives, our desires. We need to not only stop doing wrong, but we need changed hearts. We need to submit our will to his will. Otherwise, he calls us double-minded. Uh, we want our will and his will. We tell ourselves, oh, I want his will, but then I go and I want my will also. We're double-minded. Uh, we want ways of the world and self, but we want ways of him. Uh, it's used a little bit differently than, than it used in one eight, chapter 1, verse 8, but double-minded is still the idea of having two minds. Uh, here, in this case, it's the mind of yourself versus uh, versus God's will. Verse 9, grieve, mourn, and wail. Again, these are commands. Uh, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Uh, this verse is a call to repentance. True sorrow for the sin that we have in our lives is not just being sorry that you were caught, but actually sorry that your heart was so hard that you could commit such a, such a violation against God. Um, as long as the sin is just in the category of, well, that was just a mistake. I've had better days. Uh, we don't realize the seriousness. You need to call sin a sin. And the response to the grievous sin that we are doing should be one of grief. Our sins should cause us to grieve and then mourn and wail. All of those things are expressions. Um, we probably see it more when we look at other cultures like uh, the Middle East where they're just used to outwardly showing the pain that is inside them. Uh, we in America and some other cultures, we tend to a lot of times bottle up uh, those sort of emotions. Uh, but in Jesus' day, in the, in the first century, and in the Middle East culture in general, the idea is just to let it out. It, you sh it should show, okay? It's, uh, it's grief. It's very strong. It should be you feeling miserable and wretched. Um, you're wailing. You're mourning. It's a grief that can't be hidden. That's what you should feel when, when you sin against God. And that, that's a sign of repentance, that you don't want to do that anymore. It is too painful. Um, so when we pursue pleasure, our lives had been marked by this laughter and joy. And he says you need to change that laughter and joy that you get from the pleasures of this world. Uh, change it to uh, mourning and gloom. Now, now, some people could take this verse and think that uh, this gloom... Uh, and mourning is the way that Christians are supposed to act, that, that we should always be always sad and somber and just gloomy people. And that's not the case at all. Okay, Christians uh, have more reason than anyone else to have laughter and joy. Uh, and so we, we have good news. We should have the spirit of joy. It's one of the fruit of the spirit. Okay, uh, but when we sin, uh, we should be experiencing uh, the gloom and the mourning that he talks about here. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So now he's going back again to an Old Testament quote that God 
that he quoted before about God opposing the proud, but he uh, shows favor to the humble. God graciously shows favor to humble, so therefore humble yourselves. You should be humble. And again, that word means to lower yourself, to put yourself lower. Uh, we should humble ourselves for the sin of, of, of wanting the world and our own desires rather than wanting God. So he's been talking in this chapter about the, the roots of pride and this independent, selfish nature. Uh, hedonism uh, is where it comes through, flirting with sin, pride that thinks that we know better for what's good for us than what God does. And the antidote to that is to humble ourselves. The antidote to, is to recognize our rebellion against God, acknowledge those things, in other words, we confess them, we turn from them, which is repentance, and we come back again before God as his humble servants rather than as these independent, rebellious people. Uh, humble yourselves as command requires submission to God, and that's something that we're going to be doing the rest of our lives is to, to submit, be humble before God. The second half of the command is a promise. You humble yourself, and he will lift you up. Uh, God doesn't, again, God doesn't want us to be a bunch of gloomy disciples. He wants us to stand before him with joy. So he, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to restore us and lift up our heads. He's the lifter of our heads so we can look people in the eye again and have that joy. He promises to lift us up out of our guilt and our misery and have a right standing with him. That's what righteousness means, is a right standing. So practical Christianity isn't guilt-ridden. Okay, except when we sin momentarily, when we're guilty, we're sorry for that, we ask for forgiveness, and we come back to God, and we'll be joy-filled. All right, the next several verses give us some examples of behavior that are anything but humble. Okay, And so probably James was seeing this or hearing about it from the churches that he was pastoring. So he says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. So legally, uh, to slander means to make false charges or misrepresentations against someone uh, that can damage the reputation of another person. But for the Christian, uh, it's not a legal prohibition that guides us. It's the moral. It's what's right, what's wrong, what's right, even if it's legal or not. So just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's okay for us to do it. So therefore, the verb here used here, it's translated as slander refers to any kind of speaking against someone else. Uh, it may be true, uh, but it's harsh, and maybe it's unkind in the manner of its presentation. You're saying something, uh, and it causes people to think worse of the person about, uh, about you you're talking about. We can deceive ourselves and try to say, well, it's constructive criticism, um, but frequently it's not mean to be construction or building up at all. Uh, certainly love tells us that we're supposed to speak the truth in love, but uh, even when it's difficult to do so, but when we do that, we are supposed to speak the truth lovingly. Would we say what we're saying if that person were in our presence? Is that speech that we're saying loving? Is it fair? Is it kind? Does it come from a selfish desire within us? If we're talking negatively about person A to person B, then probably you're guilty of slander or speaking against someone. If you have something negative about person A, you should go talk to person A. Okay, talk to them about it. Another word for this slander is backbiting. Uh, a lot of times this occurs in gossip. Okay, we've all heard it. We've all done it. Spoken ill of others. It's a sin. Okay, it strongly conflicts with the idea of love. Love for your neighbor as yourself. Okay, we as Christians should be building each other up, not tearing them down. So, uh, the, again, the grammar that he's using here, it means instead of just uh, uh, don't, it means stop it. Okay, so evidently people have been doing it. And we can use that for ourselves. Stop uh, speaking against one another. But for quizzing, do not slander one another. And the reason he gives uh, is the one that the person who criticizes or judges a fellow Christian speaks against the law and judges it. The law that he's referring to is probably the Leviticus law that says, love your neighbor as yourself. So if you're speaking against another Christian, you're not loving your neighbors yourself. That violates that law. And when you violate the law, and we talked about this before, anytime you violate the law, basically you're placing yourself above the law. Okay, You are declared that that law is no good, or it's unnecessary, or it doesn't apply to you, that you are somehow above the law. So rather than submitting to the law and keeping it, you're sitting in judgment of the law. The picture is that you become the judge sitting in the, in the courtroom, and the law is the defendant, and you pass judgment on what parts of it are valid, 
which parts of it are invalid and you're not going to obey, or which parts maybe this person needs to valid to, to obey, but you're not going to, or other people that we like or something like that don't have to. So we're, we're judges of the law instead of keepers of the law. And James is going to remind us that there's only one lawgiver and judge in verse 12. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Okay, so again, this idea that the critic, someone who criticizes another believer, you've taken on that position of authority, and that authority is reserved for God alone. He is the only lawgiver and judge. Since he's the one who gave the law, he's the one who's qualified to judge it, to judge who kept it and who isn't keeping it. Uh, therefore, he's able to save, to say, yep, you meet the law, and to destroy, say, no, you do not meet the law. Uh, he's the one who can uh, give a crown to people who obey it and to give punishment to those who violate it. But you, who are you? He has that question. Who are you to judge your neighbor um, that you're taking God's position? Uh, he, so he's very blunt. What are you doing uh, usurping the power of God, the authority of God as judgment? Okay, and that's not to rule out uh, judges or anything. Like that. They have a, a, a role to fill. But the harsh, critical spirit that we have towards one another that's wrong, and we need to get rid of it. Okay, he's going to continue to give us another example of this wisdom that's characterized the worldly wisdom. Uh, so we're presumptuous when we talk about Christian brothers and sisters and we criticize them. We're also presumptuous when we flatly state that we're going to go do something in the days to come, as if, as if we could control the future. Verse 13, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. So here probably James is more addressing some of the businessmen, so Christian businessmen, probably more well-to-do, who travel as part of their business. Okay, and he starts off, now listen, so he's trying to get their attention again. Uh, so he's talking about the rich, and you know this letter has a lot to say about the rich, and we'll see more next week uh, that uh, he's talking about some of the rich. So these rich people probably travel as part of their business. So, so you can see the plan that they have here. They're going to go to this or that city, the fourth thing, go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. They've already got it planned out. And they know the starting time, today or tomorrow. It's going to be there. They've got it all planned. The city's been selected, the time's been selected, uh, but God has no place in their plans. Uh, there's no indication that they've consulted God. It seems that they made their plans, and they just assume that their plans are going to go the way that they, they thought they would. It's arrogance uh, that the rich think that they have everything that they need and that they are in control. They don't need to submit themselves to God. There's no allowance in here for any unforeseen circumstances that things may come up uh, beyond their control. They're just confident they'll be able to carry out their plans to the completion. James points out their fallacy in verse 14. He says, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So they don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, much less a year from now. Uh, they've been planning as if they knew exactly what the future holds, or maybe that they can even control the future. So they're very, very arrogant. Not only is their knowledge, our knowledge, limited, we, we hardly even know what's happening now. We don't know about tomorrow or a year from now. He's just trying to show our lives are very uncertain, uh, very transitory nature. Our lives are but temporary. And he sort of uses an example from from nature to sort of show this, what, what is your life? He says, you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Think of it like as the morning fog. You maybe had some, some fog days where you didn't go to school or school was delayed for a little while because of fog. The fog is in the morning, but usually by, by noon, it's gone. The mist appears for a little while and then vanishes. He says, that's what your life is like. Uh, you're just here momentarily. Uh, and you think you're making plans for way down the road when you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, instead, James offers another alternative in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that and continue on with the other plans. So the instead of saying verse 13, the Christian businessman and all of us should say, if it's the Lord's will. We, we don't live independent of God. So for us to leave God out of our plans is just, a, a, just a, an assumption, an arrogant assumption of our self-dependency, our self-sufficiency. It's a declaration of independence from God that uh, we don't need him involved in our plans. So And also it overlooks reality because we know that things happen. 
So whether people recognize it or not, uh, when they say that they will live and do this or that, uh, you need to make sure you understand it's only if it's the Lord's will. So James is not saying here, don't make plans, okay? That's not what he's saying. It's okay to make plans. We're supposed to make plans, okay? He's saying that we should seek God's will in making our plans and be aware that whatever plans we make, we need to submit our plans to his plan. Our plans can change if God wants them to change, okay? So that's why he says, if it's the Lord's will. Now, you don't necessarily have to always say, yes, I'm going to do this if it's the Lord's will, um, you can just sort of, the, the idea, again, is in the heart. Do you understand that, that uh, it's there? Even if you don't say it, uh, it's the Lord's will. So it doesn't need to be a mechanical rote. Every time you open your mouth to say something about the future, you say it's the Lord's will. But have that in mind, even if you don't say it. And you can't make it a cop-out, okay, for not making any plans. Uh, so if someone says, hey, are you going to be at quiz practice tomorrow? And you say, Lord willing, hmm. Is that person going to be there or not? I'm not sure. Sounds kind of wishy-washy to say it that way. And you could say, yes, I'll be there, Lord willing. Uh, and that way you recognize that it's possible that God may have something else for you. But you, your firm intention is to be there. So you can make plans, have firm intentions of doing something. But just realize that uh, the Lord may change those plans. So that's no excuse to be wishy-washy. Okay? You can have your yes be yes and your no be no. Uh, but still understand that even if you say yes, that that can change. Uh, God can change things. So... Uh, have that humility about the future. That's what he desires for us. So rather than subjecting their plans to God's will, many of them were uh, making their practice to boast. So in verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. Maybe this whole idea of going to this or that city, spending a year there doing business and making some money. Uh, you're boasting, and here, here's what I'm going to do. Okay, you've got these schemes all made up. Here's my path, and you're boasting about that. All such boasting, he says, is evil. So to make plans without considering God's plan is, um, again, that's the Declaration of Independence. You're saying that you, you are in charge of your fate. Uh, so the word boast, again, is that arrogance or uh, having extreme confidence in your own cleverness or knowledge or ability. Uh, so he's saying that these Christian businessmen were being arrogant uh, in their assumption that they could do things and cause it boasting. And it's evil, he says. So it's, it lacks the quality of being humble before God. So therefore, it's sinful. It's not of God. All right, James concludes the chapter. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. So this, this final verse in chapter 14 sort of sums up his emphasis on this presumption and humility. Uh, he may intend it to talk about just this, those verses right before, talking about making plans and things like that. But actually, it's a very important understanding of sin. Uh, a lot of times the definition of sin we see is like in 1 John 3, 4, that sin is lawlessness. It's going against the law of God. That's what sin is. That's what, uh, and so that's what, that focuses on the failure to observe the law of God. Uh, that's a sin of commission, okay? And that is a clear sin. But there's also the sin of omission, and that's what sort of James has here. James has this idea, anyone who knows the good that you ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So he's not like he's violating one of the laws that says, don't do this, don't do that. Don't, okay, I didn't do that. But he's saying that, what about the doing good when you know you're supposed to? That's sort of like in keeping with Jesus' teaching, uh, the sin of not doing good when one could and one should. So for example, we see the stories of the Good Samaritan. Okay, you have the priest and the Levite who come across this fellow Jew who needs help and they don't do anything. Jesus rebukes them for it. That's sin. Uh, they did They did not do the good that they knew they were supposed to do. Uh, also, in like in the parable of the sheep and the goats, uh, where the goats are rebuked for not helping the poor, the thirsty, the naked, the imprisoned. Um, they said, how did, how did we not help you? And says, you didn't do it to the least of these. So this idea, the sin of omission as well as the sin of commission. So Christianity is not just avoiding doing wrongs of this list of rules that we have. Okay, this negativism towards uh, doing evil or doing wrong. Uh, but it's also this, this, it's more of a concept of doing right. Christianity is an idea of loving your neighbor, doing what is best for them. We're not to live our lives in this fear of sinning, and therefore we have to keep on doing all these right things in order to save ourselves from hell. That's like trying to ob obtain righteousness as if it were by works, uh, is what Paul was saying. No, we go after the royal law, that gives freedom, that loving your neighbor uh, 
as yourself. Failing to do that is selfishness and sin. We know the good, we ought to do it, so let's go and do it. Otherwise, it's sin. Okay, that ends the discussion, uh, chapter four, so just one more chapter to go. Uh, again, if you have any questions, call me, text me, uh, somehow contact me, and I'm, I'll try to answer the questions as best as I can. Okay, let's, uh, let's close uh, in prayer, and then we'll be done. Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you so much for the book of James. So much truth, so much practical wisdom. Uh, it is like a mirror, though, that we see ourselves. We see where we have spoken against others. We have been arrogant. We've been prideful. We haven't been humble. We've sat in judgment of the law. Uh, we've done all those things, Lord. And so we just uh, ask your forgiveness. We come back to you. We repent. We ask your help in helping us not to do those things. We want uh, to be submissive and to love only you and not the world. Heavenly Father, be with the quizzers as they go about their week this week. Keep them safe. Uh, help them to, to keep uh, away from the virus and the virus away from them. Help them to study your word. Uh, help them to, to be able to put it into practice, into their own lives. Penetrate their heart with your word, Lord. Be with them until we meet again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, that's it. Thanks, quizzers. Study hard, and we'll see you next time for the last chapter. See you.